Hello, and welcome back to another great show of the Grateful Redhead podcast. I'm Angie Ringler, your Grateful Dead loving host, and I am joined here today by a fellow podcaster, Bob Gaddy, and he really is probably the first person that I've talked to on my show that comes from a little bit of a political angle. So I want to have Bob today on my show. I've got a few specific questions for him, but first I'm going to let Bob introduce himself. I want him to share more importantly with his background and what really has brought him to him starting his own podcast show. So Bob, welcome to the Grateful Redhead podcast and please take a minute and introduce yourself. Well, Angie, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Um, I began my career as a young reporter when I was like 19 years old. I was the first um, white guy to be hired by the black uh, Pittsburgh Courier, a weekly newspaper that was published in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for the uh, African-American community. And I'm, I'm kind of proud of that. <laughs> I broke the color line. <laughs> anyway, uh, I ended up covering state politics uh, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey for a, a national wire service and then ended up going uh, to Washington uh, to work for a couple of congressmen as press secretary and eventually as chief and chief of staff. And then, and so you can see why I'm a political guy. I mean, I've got this stuff in my background uh, and, and um, I, along the way I covered some pretty, astounding events uh, uh, like the 1968 Democratic Convention in Chicago where reporters got, um, <laughs> well, we didn't get shot, but we got tear gassed and, and clubbed. Uh, fortunately, I was inside, so I didn't have to deal with that, but it was a, it was a really dramatic uh, event of course um anyway what, i ended up what was it what was it like i mean that that must have been really scary what was that like to be there it was uh i i got no sleep i was there a week i got no sleep it was very exciting covering such a historic event um but it was scary i mean you you walk from the hotel to the convention center and and you were blasted with tear gas, uh, not directly, but the smell of it just hung in the air. And it was in the hotel lobby. It was in the, it was in the elevators. Uh, you couldn't escape it until you got to your room. Uh, they, they, it, it was a very, very scary thing. And was some of my friends... I'm sorry, was it hmm? the police who were sending out the tear gas that was... Yes, it was the police. Okay. okay. Um, uh, there may have been National Guard, but it was, largely it was the Chicago police. And, and what um, heard that event outside that was causing all that disruption? Well, it was a demonstration uh, against the Vietnam War. And, and the, the candidate, the two candidates, uh, primary candidates, uh, George McGovern, an anti-war liberal, uh, and, and um, Hubert Humphrey, uh, the uh, vice president uh, to Lyndon Johnson, LBJ had decided not to run for re-election, and and Humphrey was a Democratic. Uh, well, he was the VP, so he was the leader. Uh, the question was, who was going to get the nomination? Was it going to be McGovern, or was it going to be uh, uh, Humphrey? And, and the demonstrations uh, outside of the convention center uh, and in a big park in, in Chicago uh, were all against the war. And that's really what it was. And, and the Chicago police under the, um, under the uh, administration of, uh, of Mayor Daley uh, were really tough. Uh, they just not were going to they were just not going to put up with any kind of violence. And it wasn't just violence. They just think it was dissent. They just hated it. And um, 
at any rate, uh, I, I personally was not uh, involved in that side of the story. My job was to cover uh, some state delegations uh, and report on on the deliberations for them to who they were going to end up supporting, whether whether it would be McGovern or, or Humphrey. And, but that uh, whole feeling of what was happening then, would you, I mean, you know, we're talking 1968. What about the feelings that have happened in just the past, you know, two years time? Do, do you, do you find any, you know, connection there? Oh, in, in what you're absolutely thinking? there is. And that's one reason why I can't, stop writing and I can't stop speaking out. And my podcast is one way I do that. Uh, along with my blog site that I have called not fake news, not fake news. Um, I actually, I started that, uh, about five years ago after I retired from what became a communications business that I launched in Washington, DC, I started that podcast because I was fed up with Trump's uh, labeling of the media uh, as the enemy of the people and and his constant denigration of legitimate news reporting as fake news. Anything that was anti-Trump was fake news. And, and, um, and, it, and it was Donald Trump that was creating the fake news. Uh, I just decided that you know, I had to, I had to use my voice, whatever it was. And so at, uh, age, what am I, I'm 79 today. So, uh, at age 74, uh, I started this thing and I've been doing it daily since then. Now I have four or five writers who contribute also, so I don't have to do it, do it all, but we try to have a fresh blog almost every day. And then I do the podcast in addition to that. It is your daily blog. Is it really just commenting on the news of the day? What, what's the focus of those posts? Um, it comments on the news of the day. It, it, it It's somewhat analytical. Uh, I have a couple of, of writers who uh, are really good analysts and can one, one in particular, uh, Chris Waldron, who looks at developments today and kind of puts them in, into historical perspective. Uh, and and uh, uh, so I but it, it's, it's all based on political developments, current political developments, whether it's um, uh, whether it's racism, uh, climate change, uh, whatever. Uh, whatever is hot in the news, we try to take a look at it. And uh, uh, with a little, what I like to say, a little lean to the left. Uh, do you have comments <laughs> open on your blog posts? You I do. Know? And I do. what kind of discussions do you find are happening there? Well, actually, it's disappointing because most of the comments come on social media. I okay. cannot get these people to actually comment on my blog site. <laughs> I have a few that do, but uh, but largely it's on social media. Uh, I uh, I post uh, I send the links uh, to a number of uh, of uh, uh, Facebook pages, especially and and whether they're environmental environmental pages or pro uh progressive pages or anti-trump pages or whatever uh i get the word out that way and i get a ton and i apologize oh. for that for that Hang on a minute. God damn it. <laughs> these are the fun parts of recording a podcast there we go they go away so um, do you feel when, when you're posting your blog post on your social media where you mention that you're getting the most interaction and comments, do you feel like people yeah. are actually reading the whole post, uh, you know, the whole blog post that you write? Or do you feel like you're getting comments based on like my, what the title might be? You know, that is a really good question, Angie. Uh, oftentimes I look at it and I think, you didn't read the blog. You only read the headline. 
And that happens a lot, I think. Um, and, you know, I can't force them to read the damn thing. We don't write long. Uh, we don't write long. Uh, they average between two and four minutes to read. So they're not they're not lengthy at all. The, the longest one might be eight or nine hundred words. Generally, they're five or six hundred words, and and um, so they're not they're not lengthy at all. I do turn them into uh, commentary on my uh, Lean to the Left podcast. Uh, sometimes I'll take two or three related ones, you know, and hook them together and and uh, do a. Uh, and, and do a uh, commentary uh, using them if they are the general topic, you know, uh, and that, that, that seems to work fairly well. Yeah. I asked that because I just feel like we do overall read a lot less, you know, we're more um, prone now with social media, just kind of thumb through and, you know, clickbait kind of titly things and, and it's causing people to react. So I, I love that you're taking the time in order to put this information on your blog post and then sharing it to social. But yeah, I, I, I get the same thing too on some of our posts that we put on social that you know, I just yeah. get that vibe that people aren't reading the whole thing. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, well, you know what? I just think that's the trend today. Um, and and another thing that that is part of that too, and I have to say, I'm I'm guilty of it to some extent. That that there's so many divisions today. You're either left or you're right, and there's nothing in between. It seems, and. And so when I when I do a post that is uh, friendly and informative and good newsy, I get very little pickup. But when I do one that blasts the living, you know what, out of Donald Trump, I get hundreds. And it's just that's just how it is. So I try not to be guilty of clickbait, but I do need viewers and I do need readers. Um, and but nevertheless, I am determined. And and when I do a uh, podcast, especially every podcast I do, I promote on my blog site, and and um, and I do a little summary of 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 the podcast in that promo piece. And um, and try to pick up some uh, some uh, viewers of the or listeners to the podcast that way, and it's somewhat successful. So, what do you think? I mean, you've been out there in you know the in journalism for a long time. What do you think that that the way to kind of bring this together could be? I mean, do do you have any you know suggestions of how we can reduce that divide? You know, um, I have a friend who started a uh, site that is called the Olive Branch. Uh, and his objective, he said, was to do exactly that, to try to generate conversation between the, the left and the right and try to find some accord. Uh, however, he, he is a right-wing crazy and so his effort, in my opinion, was self-defeating. And after allowing him to use some of my material, um, I pulled it back and said, don't do it, because I got tired of him going on that site with my material and telling people not to get vaccinated. And I just wouldn't allow that, so I I pulled it back. But But... I, I do think there needs to be there needs to be some way to um, to to bring these sides together, uh, and you know, for my part, I try not to be I try not to be overly dramatic or overly uh, what's the word I'm looking for. I try to be responsible in what we in what we uh, what we write. Uh, and not be just crazy left, uh, but I have to say that a lot of this, a lot of the rhetoric that comes from the other side, just angers me to the point that I can't keep my mouth shut sometimes. 
Yeah. And I, and I feel like, you know, I feel like every, every side says that about each other, right? It is like, yeah, well, they, they, do, think, well, they, do. they think we're crazy. We think they're crazy, vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. I've often thought that what if we just got rid of the labels altogether, right? What if you didn't know somebody was um, a particular party affiliation? Would that make any difference, you think, on how we approach and talk to each other? Well, maybe it would. Uh, maybe it would, uh, but nevertheless, so we are, last night um, we were in a restaurant and we were talking to some strangers, some people who were just sitting near us and struck up a conversation with us. And and they asked me what I did, and I told them about uh, about my podcast and about my blog site. And I was reluctant. I was worried. Now I'm in South Carolina, okay, so. There are a lot of people uh, on the red side here, uh, a lot more reds than there are blues. Uh, so I was reluctant. I didn't know whether to actually tell them, you know, my podcast is lean to the left um, and my blog site is not fake news. Um because I was concerned about what their reaction would be, and I didn't want to get into any kind of, you know, pissing match. However, I did, and it was fine, and and they were receptive. And actually, the uh, the uh, the woman uh, asked me how she could uh, listen to uh, my Lean to the Left podcast. So that was unfounded my concerns but nevertheless they're there and they're there all the time um yeah and i guess even more interesting would be to know if they were democrat republican how their views were and whether they thought differently than you did but were willing to listen to your information you know we naturally attract those who believe what we do or you know already believe in the lifestyle that we have and So I think that it's it's even more important to to find that way to reach over the aisle, so to speak, and and be able to share the information. But it's much harder these days. I mean, even in my yeah, go ahead. I I was just going to say that what you do, Angie, with your podcast and and the effort that you are making with your with your business, uh, your your pro environmental business and your whole approach. Uh, really, it's about looking for good in people, and and I just think that is that is great, and and I commend you, you for that. Thank yeah. you very much. Appreciate you saying yeah. that. I yeah. mean, I feel like matter we are of fact, I'm the- planning on buying some of your products. All right, that's <laughs> what I like to hear. <laughs> yeah, I think we'll start with the detergent. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, it's it's no different. I, that's what I was going to say earlier. It's like, you know, whether you're talking politics or environment, it, for me right now, it's about finding people who really aren't already in my niche. You know, it's about yeah. finding people who don't really believe in my lifestyle or live my lifestyle of no waste, you know, uh, eating clean, those kind of things, because it's about branching out beyond that. And that's where I find that I've got to get kind of creative and clever and allow myself to be more open to hearing the other sides of people's conversations. More importantly, what are their concerns and why is it that maybe they have a little bit of hesitation of what I'm trying to share or the way that I live? Because we all start on our paths at different point, you know, and I'm always trying to remind myself, I got to meet people where they are in their journey. I didn't start out at this point. You didn't start out at that point, you know, where you are today. And it's sometimes it's hard for us to remember where we were before we got to this, what we feel is very solid ground right now. So yeah, um, I think that's true. And, yeah. and I think that it comes through sharing the information. Like that's, that's why, you know, I, I like the fact of what you're doing and, and putting the, the content out there in a variety of formats, hoping to reach different people and keeping the conversation going, even though the conversation might get a little hasty and heated and from time to time, <laughs> but 
you know, yeah. with any luck, people walk away thinking, wow, you know, maybe, maybe I am open to that point of view, or that's interesting to me. I never thought of it that way before. And I think those you know, are Angie, the moments. Yeah. Your, 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 com- your comment there just made me think. I keep getting this uh, request from someone who is representing a, a pro Trump um, author wanting that person to be on my podcast, my Lean to the Left podcast. And I have not even responded uh, because I frankly don't know whether I want to do it or not, but maybe I should. Maybe I should and see what, what yeah. where she's coming from and what she's got to say. Yeah, because you know? you, right now I could tell that you've already made the assumption, right, about this person and you haven't even given them a chance to have that conversation. Which yeah, is well, I made, I made the assumption. I, I made the assumption based on the promo material that I was sent, which said she's a former Mrs. America who is a outspoken pro-Trump person. <laughs> <laughs> I can see so where you would two, have your... <laughs> there's two things there. Yeah. Former Mrs. America, I mean, okay, fine. Um, I'm not much on on beauty pageants. <laughs> and I don't even know, is that a beauty pageant? But, um, but pro-Trump, outspoken pro-Trumper. I mean, those two things, I just go like, I don't really know if I want to talk to her. I've got plenty of... of uh, of interviews, you know, I do them twice a week and I'm booked through the end of February. And, awesome. you know, if, if I want to stretch them out like you do. <laughs> <laughs> you have maybe the next I two should. years taken care of. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should, but um, I just like doing them too much. You know, I, I'll post a thing saying that this this podcast and that podcast is going to be on such and such a date, and I end up I always end up getting them done a couple of days in advance, and I post them anyway, and then I do a blog to promote them, and you know, <laughs> so I well, just I do think, it. I think it's really you know about being out of our comfort zone that really makes us grow. You know, those are the moments yeah. that we're growing, and you know, yeah. look, even for me to have this conversation with you is out of my comfort zone. You know, is we're it not really? really? Yeah, I mean, we're not here. You're not like this eco person that I would be like, oh, I could just jump right on and talk to Bob forever about, you know, our zero waste lifestyles. You know, I knew that wasn't the conversation going well, in. I, mean, but- I can talk about that if you want to, because I'm all for it. You're for I, it, I but it's not oh, yeah. really what your focus is and what you're doing. So I knew that no. this was to be a little bit out of my comfort zone. Yeah. And yeah. that that's really why I wanted to explore this conversation with you to find out, you know, how do we bridge this kind of gap between the information right. you're sharing and the information that we want to be sharing with other people? Yeah, and- well, I think the information you share helps to do that, probably more than what I do. Because, like I said before, um, well, first of all, everybody has to understand the climate crisis and what we're facing. I mean, they just do. And and for people to just say, oh, well, that's not my worry. I'm not worried about that. All they have to do is look and see what's going on right now with all this, all the, with the, I just read today that uh, the past five years have been the hottest in, in, in forever, the, ho- the hottest five, the past five years. And we've had all these horrible, 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 devastating storms and floods. What do they think? This just isn't happening. And, and, and every, reasonable, responsible scientist tells us this. And and international bodies uh, tell us this. And for and and to have a president who says this is just all BS is and and pulls us out of the Paris Climate Accord just as a height of your responsibility and right. and threatens the future of the country. And thank God he's not there anymore. 
Yeah. Listen, and even for the people who do believe it, you know, and who believe in the science of it and all of that, quite honestly, we are so wrapped up in just trying to survive on a daily level, you know, trying to get through the pandemic, trying to deal with the price increases of, you know, our daily living expenses. And then the decrease, you know, our, our incomes are not keeping up with the, you know, the inflation and what's happening for all those things, groceries and insurance and all those things that, that we need to to have a, a solid foundation and live a good life that, It's very hard for people to say, how can I worry about the world when the world is so big and I'm barely surviving in my own home? I'm barely surviving in my daily day. And I feel that that's that to me is the biggest bridge that I'm trying to cross when it comes to encouraging people to like try different products, you know, when it comes down to, Hey, try my product, right? It doesn't leave any plastic waste. You're not affected by all the chemicals that most products are made from, but people have to find a way that it, that they connect it to their own life in order to make those, those changes and those decisions. And that only comes through the conversations and whether it be like how we're having, you know, face to face or whether it's through the written word, um, you know, those are the only ways that people are going to say, okay, how is this affecting my wallet? Or how is this affecting my health? Is it affecting the health of my family or, or, you know, my immediate surroundings? If it's not, if they don't make that connection, they're not going to make the changes that are needed to expand upward, right? That, that make these bigger changes on a global level. And quite honestly, I feel like most of the changes have to come from the powers that be, you know, our, our powers in government, just like you were saying, we have to have that leadership yep. at the top. It can't yep. be these leaders who are denying what's happening. Yep. Um, you know, you've been in this industry for a while of the, like the political realm. Do you, do you mm-hmm. have any suggestions of how individuals can become more involved in that political side to catapult us to more good? Well, yes, I do. Um, first of all, I think a lot of people have the the assume that if they contact their congressman and and express a view about a a certain issue that 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 won't be paid attention to, and that's wrong. From my experience, when I worked for two members of the House of Representatives and I ran both of their offices. Um, now, admittedly, this was some time ago, but nevertheless, I do not think this has changed. And that is that when we heard from a, a voter, and remember, that is the key word, the voter, we paid attention. And if, if we had 10 letters that came in, now back then it was letters, not emails, but if we had 10 letters that came in on a given topic, expressing a a certain point of view we paid attention to that and and not that we didn't pay attention if we only got one but it's it's human nature that when you get a a a a large uh voice about a given topic that you're going to pay attention to that and and a congressman who is running for re-election every two years That means that after his first year or her first year in office, they have to start planning their next campaign. And so they are they are constantly figuring out how to reach out to to their uh, constituents, their voters, and to get them to to stay with them or 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 move to them in the next election. And so they care. Now, it might not be for the altruistic reasons that you might wish, but it doesn't really matter the reason. If, if, they're, if, if they're willing to listen to you just because they want your support, they're listening. And so um, I would encourage people, send your emails, make your phone calls, um, send snail mail letters, um, 
contact your congressman. And when you hear that they're in your in your area uh, for whatever reason, go go uh, to the meetings or go to the event and and approach them and say, hello, I'm your constituent and I care about this. Uh, don't be shy because especially with members of the House of Representatives, they are supposed to be the closest to the people. The Senate is a little bit more, after all, they don't have to run every six year, every only every six years. So, you know, they can diddle daddle around and do whatever they want for four years. And then after, after that, then they have to start paying attention. Uh, that's cynical, but that's, <laughs> I worked on the <laughs> house the size, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> and, but the House of Representatives is truly the people's house, and you need to take advantage of that and and let them know how you feel about this. Even if it's just you see an article in the newspaper or online, send an email, put the link, and say, this guy really got it right, or I am really concerned about this issue. Put the link in and and uh, watch it on social media. Use social media, too. Um, every member of Congress uh, has House and Senate, has a Facebook page, have Twitter feeds, have Instagram. Some of them are on TikTok if they're cool enough. Uh which I'm not, I, I haven't figured out how to use TikTok yet. For... <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I guess we're not cool enough, Bob. <laughs> well, I think maybe we're just at least I'm too old. I don't know. But I intend to try. Oh, I intend good. to try. Good. I got to figure out how to, how to take some clips from my podcast and turn them into TikTok uh, yeah. <laughs> entries. I don't know. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't, but. But I, I think that was really solid advice what you just gave about yeah. we are being heard, but we probably yeah. don't think that we are. And, and you know, yeah. I, I'm guilty I of that, too. Like, sometimes I feel like, ah, are they really listening? You yeah. know, I, yeah. I have yeah. reached out. I have made phone calls and I've sent yeah. emails. So I'm glad to hear that, that you know, yeah. what you're saying I, I, is that I, I'm doing the right thing. Yeah, another thing, Angie, is you have to remember that the most important decisions uh, on Capitol Hill are made in the committees. And so if you are worried about uh, a particular, let's just say, piece of environmental legislation and you, that you, wanna, you want to see it passed, um, in addition to reaching out to your own congressperson, you should also contact the committee. And it's just very easy just Google, uh, and you'll find the address uh, to the to the appropriate committee for whatever the issue is, and and send and send the chair of that committee um, uh, a communication and express your view, especially if if an issue is currently being considered by that committee. I will tell you a story from if I have a minute, from um, when I was working for, a, this was a Republican congressman, the first one that I worked for um, uh, back in the 1970s. And he was a member of a committee that was dealing with offshore drilling legislation. And one day, uh, an oil industry lobbyist uh, contacted the office and invited the congressman to lunch. And we knew that the issue that this person wanted to talk about would be the offshore drilling legislation that my boss was part of the committee that was working on. So my boss asked me to go to the, uh, do the lunch. So I did. And this lobbyist uh, reached in his pocket handed me an envelope and I said, what is that? And he said, well, we really like what your congressman is doing and we want to express our appreciation. And I said, well, you know what, that would be totally inappropriate right now. As you well know, that legislation is in markup, which is a very sensitive time of the process. <laughs> and and um, 
I cannot take that. I presume that's a contribution. You can wait until this is over with. And if you still feel the same way, you can send in your contribution to our um, campaign. And so I went back to the office and my boss asked me what the guy wanted. And I told him and he said, where's the check? And I said, well, my <laughs> I said, well, my job is to save you from this kind of thing. So you'll be getting the check later, maybe. He said, oh, okay, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to remember that there are a lot of forces, big forces, yeah. that are money talks. And, yeah. and so the only way to overcome that is for a lot of people to speak up. Yes, it's we true. all got to be heard. And the more we can group together and support each other to do that, you you yeah. nailed it. You're so right. Yeah. No, Thanks for sharing that reason. story, Bob. That was that was good. <laughs> well, that's one reason why even uh, with all this other stuff I've got going on, I also do communications work for our local Democratic Party here in uh, South Carolina, uh, which... Um, uh, is an uphill struggle because I live in Myrtle Beach and it's dominated by the, by the Republicans. But nevertheless, I do what I can uh, and manage their website and other other stuff. And, uh, right, we just keep picking away at it. And you didn't you tell to, me you're in the midst of writing a book? I, I am. I wrote I wrote one. Uh, it's called Hijack Nation: uh, Donald Trump's Attack on America's Greatness. Uh, and it basically uh, is in two volumes. It's basically a collection of not fake news blogs uh, that focused on a major portion of the Trump administration. Um, I'm working on the final volume of that uh, of that series. It's going to have a different name uh, for a very practical reason, uh, and that is that Amazon would not allow me to advertise that book on Amazon because it had Trump's name in the title and his picture on the cover. Yeah. Interesting. So it's after amazing I what went, they decide on Amazon. After I went through all that work and, and a, a co-writer and I uh, did this book, um, after I went through all that work and attempted to purchase advertising on Amazon, to, and the reason why I published it through Amazon was because of the vast audience. And, and then they said, no, you can't, you can't advertise it on Amazon. So I am going to, re, I'm, volume three will be a similar approach, but it will not have his picture on it. It won't have any politician's picture on it or name in the title. I think a great book that you could write would be comparing what went on in the 60s to what goes on today and how hmm. things haven't changed much, but we have to start learning from those lessons back then. So like the, the reason I find it interesting is that, you know, I was born in 69. So what, what the story that you were telling were before my time. And I feel like me and everybody born after me, kind of has that feeling of, well, I didn't live through it. I, I don't really know a lot about it. Certainly right. what I learned in high school about history was not, if it wasn't, most of it probably wasn't very accurate, but they just skimmed the surface of most things, you know? So yeah. I feel that learning from those lessons are really important that a lot of that still goes on today. So you know, I'll actually, just throw my is, two cents in. That is a good idea. Um, it would take a ton of work, but it's a good idea. <laughs> I'm also working on a novel, too. Um, and it's going to be a political thriller. It's going to deal with guns and mass shootings hmm. and and politics. Uh, wow. And uh, I'm working on it. I've got a couple of chapters written, and I don't know how long it's going to take me. But I hope, oh. to, I hope to finish it by the end of this year. Uh, I, I, I get like all like even nervousy just when you say, you know, the, I, the, the, that whole thing just makes me so sad. And I, well, I it's know. really terrible. It's really terrible. I know. So I know. we won't even go into that. We will, we, will, we will start to wrap up our podcast on a very positive note because okay. I feel like the information that you shared about 
how to really contact our congressmen and our representatives and saying, you know, the House of Representatives is really our house and we can have our voices heard. And to me, that was the biggest takeaway, you know, from our conversation today is that we should make our voices heard and we are being heard. And I think that's a really good reminder for us in order to combat the climate issues and other issues that we're having. It's no different than the gun control and, you know, those kind of issues, the negative issues that are out there as well that are harming us daily, daily. Absolutely. So, Bob, I want to thank you so much for really taking time today and, you know, having this conversation with me and sharing your experiences. But more importantly, where can people find you when they want to hear more about what you have to say? Well, very easy. First of all, uh, my my blog site is notfakenews.biz. So all all together, notfakenews.biz. And on that blog site, there is a tab for my podcast. So if you want to check out Lead to the Left, just click on that tab. Um, and uh, people can also contact me at info at notfakenews.biz. And I'll be happy to respond to anyone who wants to reach out. Fantastic. And um, did you say you have a Facebook page as well? Oh, yes, I do. Um, I have four. <laughs> but but <laughs> I have a Lean to the Left uh, uh, Facebook page. And I have another one, uh, GNET Strategic Communications Uh, which is the name of the company that I operated. And I still have the Facebook page and I post things there all the time. So cool. Well, Bob, it's been a real pleasure. And I thank you so much for being on the Grateful Redhead podcast today. And I hope that we continue this conversation again another day too. Well, I'd love to do that. Uh, And and I enjoyed having you on uh, Lean to the Left as well, Angie. It was great. Thank you so much. All right. Well, guys, this has been another episode with Bob Gaddy here on the Grateful Redhead podcast. So if you enjoyed listening to this episode, please subscribe so you can get notified of when we put out our shows. But more importantly, if you know somebody cool like Bob, please reach out to me and let me know. Let me connect with them so we can have them on the show as well. So thank you again. And until we until we are here again, just be kind to each other and love one another. Peace out. So before you go today, I want to thank you for listening to this episode. You know, I've built a business on formulating natural household cleaning and body products without plastic bottles or plastic packaging. So if you'd like to give them a try, head on over to wastefreeproducts.com and use promo code GRATEFULREDHEAD for 10% off your entire order. Thanks for listening.